Hello and welcome to Let's Talk, a series of podcasts produced by the Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation on the issues that matter to us, the issues that we know matter to you too. Substance use prevention, research, treatment of addiction, recovery management, advocacy, and education. I'm your host, William Moyers, and today we have a story of hope brought to us by Holly S. Welcome, Holly. Thank you. Thanks for being here again. Um, I'm so struck by the fact that as a young person in recovery, you've been so willing to stand up and speak out. You were on the stage at Hazel and Betty Ford in Center City, Minnesota, when we had the drug czar there. Yep. You shared your story that day. How did that feel for you to be up on that stage? It felt really um, awesome. I spent 56 days at Hazelden, you know, as a, as a patient, three times a day, I was sitting in, you know, in those seats, looking yeah. up the stage, and so to be on the other side of that, um, and even having the confidence to speak in front of a group of people was astounding. My my teachers would be proud. Yeah, you've come a long way. <laughs> yeah. So you tell us just a little bit about your your uh, addiction journey. Uh, the first time you used, do you remember it? Yeah, I do. Um, I was 14. Um, I was at a bonfire. My brother was four years or is four years older than me, um, and so he had friends in his grade that were siblings of kids in my grade, and so um, we went to a bonfire one night and drank, and it tasted horrible, but it made me feel calm and at ease, and I was like, okay. You know, it's kind of like you, I hear often that, aha, this, this is what I needed. That's, it was, I kept drinking more. <laughs> you weren't looking for it, but you found it. Right, exactly. And, mm-hmm. and um, I never wanted to find that. And I never thought I would have a problem with alcohol because my dad was, suffered from a substance use disorder. So that wasn't in my plan. So you knew you had a little bit of history. Mm-hmm. You drank, it felt good, even though it tasted lousy right. and alcohol was the drug that you continued to use correct Correct. yeah it was um, up until I was 24 years old um, in college I did use Adderall and Vyvanse I was prescribed that and and abused that after you know a few months of having it um, and then it just any any mind altering substance it was you know zero to a hundred all the time um, I, I didn't have a <laughs> The turn off button. And then the, the day came when um, you knew you couldn't do this anymore. Tell us about that day. Yeah, um, so I actually, when I was probably like 21, I knew, I mean, I had always had a bad gut feeling, like my drinking is not normal. You know, it's not that I would drink every single day, but it was every single time I drank, I would black out. Um, when someone told me they didn't black out, I was, genuinely surprised Mm. like what (laughs) that's not what you do when you drink um and that was scary you know and and the waking up and not remembering um but when i started drinking every day and when i started drinking by myself and when i started using it as a coping mechanism that's when i was like okay (laughs) this isn't right um and that was around like 20, 21 to 24 years old, where it just progressively got so much worse to where I was totally isolating and just drinking by myself in my room and staying there. Mm. And just before you had your bottom, you um, had a family tragedy. Yeah, so um, my dad died from the disease of alcoholism, and that was a long time coming. I mean, I grew up watching him drink as a you know as a young kid and and I didn't know what that silver and white and red can was but I knew that the more that piled up next to his recliner the more he wasn't going to be my dad you know he the more beer he drank or whatever um, so that was a scary thing as a kid for my brother and I um, and then after my parents got a divorce when I was in f- fifth grade it just progressively got worse Um, and then it's really hard to watch somebody slowly and then quickly wither away Um, and and I had to grieve the loss of my dad twice Um, the first time when 
alcoholism totally consumed him, um, or where the disease totally consumed him, and then once again when he was actually gone. Um, and I honestly think the first time was worse, um, because this dad that I loved so much wasn't the same. Mm -hmm. And so for me, like when he passed away, I, I was even deeper in my addiction, right? Like you'd think that'd be a wake up call. Um, and it was to some extent, but I, did, I had no idea how to cope with it and what to do. Um, and so I just kept drinking. For four more months? For four more months, yeah. And you said enough. Yeah, and then I said, I'm gonna die or I'm gonna get help. Um, you know, I started really experiencing the, the physical withdrawals, you know, not being able to go X amount of hours without the shaking, the sweating. My, I just, I watched my dad do it for so many years. And to be experiencing that myself, I was like, I don't want to live that way. Um, and my dad dying gave me a second chance at life because that brought me to Hazelden Betty Ford. Um, and and that helped me get through sober living and IOP um, and counseling financially. That's what that money mm -hmm. did for me. Mm -hmm. And what, that was, uh, what year was that that you found recovery? Uh, November 1st, 2017. So here we come up on, it'll be soon two years. We're yeah. here in the fall of 2019. Mm -hmm. what's, been, um, what's been the toughest part of your last two year journey in recovery? You know, I think it's really figuring out myself and figuring out my feelings and, and boundaries. To, to actually sit with discomfort isn't easy. You know, it, it takes a while to get, to get used to. And it, I would feel a little bit out of control, out of sorts. You know, I'm like, how am I supposed to handle this? And, um, and by just sitting with it, I've and reaching out to peers and the sober community, you know, I found that, okay, this shall pass and I can, I can do it. Mm -hmm. Shortly, you um, will be graduating from college. Yep. Your degree is in? Uh, community health education. Where does that come from? What do you want to do with that? Um, yeah, so I, at first I wanted to do nursing. I wanted to go on for nursing and actually work in Ignatia. I oh, had such, Ignatia being the uh, detox yeah, exactly, unit. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I loved my nurse so <laughs> much and I was like, I want to be her. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I'm really looking forward to um, exploring the advocacy piece. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a lot of what community health education is, health promotion, intervention, disease prevention. In the arena of addiction and recovery? Yeah, you absolutely, want to do that. yeah. Great. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about it. And your internship has been working in a, a sober, for an organization that promotes s sober living, right? Yep, yeah, St. Paul Sober Living. Um, and it's, it's more of a structured sober living. In but the it's, Twin Cities. Yeah, yeah. It, but it's all about finding life in recovery, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. life beyond treatment mm -hmm. and, and finding meaningful relationships and sober friends because that's that's hard um i i believe for me had i gone home to south dakota it would have been hard um because in st paul the twin cities there's what 500 600 meetings a week it's incredible i mean how many recovering people there are and so many young people right yeah and it's yeah. i feel normal yeah yeah what um we know through these let's talk podcasts they've become incredibly popular over the last couple of years, um, thanks to a lot of, of my colleagues who work so hard to make them possible, but we've discovered that lots and lots of people listen and watch them. And, and of course, at the end of the day, though, there are a lot of people who are listening and watching who are trying to find an answer mm -hmm. for their own problem or for a family member's problem or a girlfriend's problem or a grandparent's problem. So your story is one of inspiration, but what would you tell those people who are listening or watching right now um, as it relates to their own fears about getting help, to their own sense of hopelessness, to their own sense that they can't do it? What's your message? Yeah, well, I'd like to start off by saying um, the first tool I used was a podcast. Hmm. I was Googling um, 
online meetings because I didn't know what resources I had. Um, and so I, I would listen to a podcast every night that pertained to recovery. Um, but I think I, the hardest part is for me was asking for help. Um, and there are so many resources that I had no idea existed, right? So to, to look into it and to ask for help because I thought I was the only one. I was the only 24-year-old woman who was struggling with this and I was gonna be judged. But I think from everyone I've met, I know so many people. The majority of people I know have been, you know, have experienced this disease in family or friends and people are so willing to help. Um, and I, now looking back at it, I realize how brave it was to acknowledge that, hey, I don't have to live this way and I really can do something about it. Um, and because I did something about it, I've made amazing friends. I have my dog, I have my own apartment, you know, thing, the amount I've achieved in the almost two years I have of sobriety is more than I have in my entire life on my own. You know, I found independence. Um, and so I would just say, you know, f find local resources, tell somebody, talk about it. And if, if, you're, re if you're really questioning your drinking or your, your using habits, then you should listen to your instinct, listen to your gut. Because um, I, I didn't listen to my gut right away, um, but I'm sure glad I did at 24 years old versus, you know, five years from now, or I don't know if I'd be alive, so. And we're sure glad that you listened to your gut too and reached out and got help and mm -hmm. have turned your adversity into the opportunity to stand up and speak out and to share with other people who are listening to this podcast and in all the other ways that you've done it. We are so grateful that you've taken the time to, to give back, Holly, your story of hope. On behalf of our executive producer, Lisa Stangle, I'm your host, William Moyers, and we thank you for joining another edition of Let's Talk, a series of podcasts, which at the end of the day are all about what Holly brought to us today, all about hope and help and healing. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again.